Welcome in to another edition of Kicking It. I'm Jeff Woody. I'm here with uh, Grant Mahoney. We are brought to you by Kelderman Manufacturing. It is planting season. If you need something adjusted or amended prior to planting season, Kelderman Manufacturing, good cyclones, great guy. Again, steel trap handshake, if you if that's the thing that you value. Uh, I, it's one of the things that I value. You just don't want to know limp fish handshakes. And speaking of limp fish handshakes, Grant. How you doing, buddy? I don't give limp fish handshakes, but I'm doing great though. Uh, I'm gonna hijack this for a second. Over the weekend, I bought myself two hive kits. Okay, now let's let's uh, oh. let's. I feel like context. Uh, most people understand that you are getting into the honey making business. Yeah. So hive it. kits is not like uh, a a kit where you like put it in an envelope and send it to someone you're uh, you hate and that that breaks them out in hives. It's actual like beehives. I've looked into that too, but yeah, that's generally that'll get you on put on some. It, some list yeah and it did so what what i bought was uh the hives like the wooden boxes that the 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 frames that the bee uh babies if you will brood brood is what it's called okay and honey would go on so i bought those those kits um i have a location for both of those hives that um once i get the actual bees which i ordered over the over the weekend as well how, nukes, do you, how does nukes? one ship those? Like, is it a specific shipping service or is it like some poor FedEx guy who's just getting like, well, it's like a Tommy boy. It just happens to so so just get, just opens, it just busts open. Bees. I, I'm allergic to bees, man. I, so if, if you order a package is what it's called, you can order a package from someone locally where you drive to wherever and pick it up or you can order a package from California and that's just that. It's a package that's in a box that's probably, I don't know, two feet by six inches wide by a foot and a half tall. That's literally a package of bees. You and have, they just ship it via FedEx. Yeah, you you, you have. Oh you my have, god, that poor FedEx. They're not people. wrapped up. The bees don't get out there. It's 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 sealed up well. But you have to. That's alert. what you think. Yeah, you you have to alert the, the post office you're shipping bees. Um, <laughs> yeah, for good reason. Yeah, for but, good I, reason. but I I I got mine from a, a place in Elkhart. Um, they're nukes, is what they're called. So it's a five frame nuke, which is which is a nucleus. So you're buying hives and nukes. Yep, nucleus a nucleus of a hive. So it'll have five frames in it. Three frames will be brood, which is basically um, baby. Bee babies. Bee babies, yep. And then two frames of honey, which is what you need to get your hive started. So I'll take those five, put them in the middle of, of one of my, my beehive boxes with five other empty frames, and then poof, it'll go from there. Honeys. Honey, baby. Mahoney bees. That's right. Mahoney bees. Mahoney. Honey bees. So honey, honey bees. I've got my, uh, my, my bee jacket in my car. I thought about bringing it in here and wearing it for the episode. A bee like, jacket? Yeah. Not actual bee. It was like, are you talking about like the, the, the headgear and like the you full protective get it? gear? No, you don't, you don't need to go get it. Hey, let's pause the show. Let me go get it. <laughs> All right. Uh, for those uh, audio listeners, we are uh, really killing it with putting beekeepers outfits on. Uh, the, I think the we're going to talk not much about like any real current events because it doesn't really pertain to Iowa State and also the stuff that we're going to talk about theoretically would age pretty quickly because the transfer portal is still open. There's some some guys that the men's team, the men's basketball team is probably going to get, possibly going somewhere between probably and possibly, but we don't know for sure until they actually sign. Um, but with like, and I, I I don't know how the women's transfer portal has actually like opened or closed or who's who the targets or whatever. So we kind of, I don't know, going forward, there's no better time, I think, for me to talk about the excitement of next year than at least fresh off the end of the first year. So we're going to do today because everyone's still jazzed. Like we mentioned it last week and then Williams and Bloom mentioned it a little bit later, thinking that it was new content, but it's not because we already said it because we beat them to the punch and we're uh, Scoop and Williams and Bloom. Is we have... If you think about the four major sports that really people really care about at Iowa State, which are men's and women's basketball, football, and wrestling, those are the ones that are kind of the the big draws of whether it's TV or ticket revenue. There has probably never been a year where all four of them are on track to be as good as they are all at the same time, while not having in the end of a runway. Because like if you think like the early 2000s where like Seneca was around and the football team was good and like the early kind of mid Fenley years and or, uh, then you have, you know, obviously F Tinsley and Pfizer and like back with Kale Sanderson, like th there was good there, but there's also the end is nigh, you know, like you're it, it, about to have guys like everybody's going to graduate, everybody's going to leave. And, you know, this is the last year that this can happen. I don't think if you look at any one of the teams it looks like there's going to be a drop-off. Like, this doesn't feel like 
uh, your your plane is taking off off a cliff where if you don't get this thing up and running, it's going to crash into the canyon. It's like the runway is continuing to go, but it feels like the planes for each one of these can go up. So what we're going to do uh, is kind of sport by sport, just talk about how exciting, like the exciting parts and kind of realistic expectations going into the summer to sort of build the fun part of this off season, not talking about gambling, not talking about guys we're missing, not talking about suspensions. And for those uh, business dorks, like I am a business dork, uh, we're not going to do a SWOT analysis, but a SWOT analysis for those that haven't done is, is uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what is what are you good at? What are you bad at? What is the chance? That, what is the biggest chance that you could have to capitalize on these things? And what's the biggest threat in the way of doing that? But without doing like opportunities and threats, because it doesn't, that sounds like a little antagonistic. Uh, we're going to do like upside and downside for each one. So it's like SWUD. We're doing a SWUD oh. on each one of the teams. So strengths, weaknesses, what are they good at? What are they bad at? Presumably going forward. And what's the upside and what's the downside of each one of the teams? So I want to I want to I want to change the SWUD. I want to change the W to a P somehow. Spud. Spud. Strengths. Uh, put downs. Put downs. Uh, perceived weaknesses. Yes. Okay. Spuds. Spud. We're gonna do a spud. Spud. Uh, okay. So I think just because it's the most fresh, I, I, let me let me just okay. let me interject. Well, 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 I mean, I'm gonna interject okay. real quick. Um, okay. we're we're gonna talk about individual teams, obviously, um, as they go. But I think one thing that I wanted to just kind of start that was that. When you look at the the men's uh, the men's football team, the football team, there's only one. Yep. Um, and the women's basketball team is this last year. I feel like both teams overachieved, and we thought that both were in a rebuilding phase. Now, um, both of those are in like a not even like a reloading phase, but almost. Yeah. But basketball, men's basketball, very much is not rebuilding, but reloading. Yeah, reloading, and also. I mean, sort of taking a step up kind of the the prestige echelon ladder. Yes. Because, you know, for a while, Iowa State, let's let's start with men's basketball just because it's the most, fr- the season is the most fresh. So for, for a long time, we Iowa State fans have known how good Iowa State is. And Iowa State has won a bunch of conference championship tournaments over the, the last few years. Haven't won a regular season tournament because brick and bill sell. Uh, but they've been good and they've been like a, you know, sweet 16, the past two or two of the last three years, they've been to the tournament the last three years. They've been to the sweet 16, what five times in the last eight years or 10 years, something like that. So they've been consistently a pretty good team, but you don't look at Iowa state on the same level that you look at. Baylor has a national championship as much as you want to, as long as, as annoying as it is, if you're some, uh, if you're the producing manager for ESPN or Fox sports or CBS and uh, up until this season, like the end of this season, if you had the chance in June to schedule basketball games where you're going to be sending your top talent in January or December, and there's Baylor versus anybody and Iowa State versus anybody, you're probably going to choose the Baylor game up until this year. Well, Iowa State has the chance and the likelihood of kind of bumping themselves up a rung in sort of the national conversation because Iowa State, we know that Iowa State's good, but they've also not been to an Elite Eight in 25 years so now this team has the potential of kind of popping that up from a pretty good team that is easy to root for two or three four seeds somewhere in the tournament to being consistently competing for a one or a two seed most of the time i don't want to say exactly like arizona because arizona has a little bit more historical you know national championships loodles and stuff like that but uh like in arizona i mean that type of Arizona probably didn't deserve a two seed in the way that we felt other teams like Iowa State deserved a two seed. But because they're Arizona, they get the benefit of the doubt and get bumped up. It feels like Iowa State... Same with Baylor. Because Baylor is Baylor, they get bumped up from wherever they were to a three. Yeah, from a four to a three. So it feels like Iowa State has has the opportunity to enter that echelon. Uh, Going into this offseason, let's start on the strengths part because that's fun. What is this team going to do well? Like, what what is the strengths of this team? Assuming... There's a couple, let's say that we don't know exactly who it's going to be, but let's say they add a couple, like a wing and a forward, like somewhere in their position wise, don't know who it's going to be. I mean, have a, a decent idea who it could be, but don't know for sure. Yeah. Um, maybe just someone, you know, that's a power five, maybe someone from like the the summit league. We'll say, um, I, I, I feel like obviously defense is always going to be while, while TJ's at the helm, defense is always going to be Iowa state strength. That's where they're hang, They're going to hang their hat. Um, you know, I, I think, we kind of saw it this year with, you know, the with, with Jiggy coming in, with Keyshawn coming in, um, Milan in a way. Milan even said it too, that T 
TJ kind of focused more on shooters and offensive guys, knowing he can teach them the defensive side of things. And that is a big reason why Milan came to Iowa State because he knew that he had it. And he said that, uh, I think, um, post game, one of the last games. I think it's to Rob Gray, actually. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. So, anyway. So, yeah. So, so he, he had said that a big reason, I think it was to Rob, a big reason why he came to Iowa State is because he knew that TJ was going to make his defensive game improve because if he wanted to get to the next level, he, know, he, he knew he needed to do that. So, I would say first and foremost, defense is is, is something that Iowa State's always going to be known for, similar to like you know Houston. So I think I think that when people think of Virginia, they think of strong defense and yeah. hold, hold people to you know below fifty points, or whatever. So I think Iowa State's kind of getting there as well too. But also, I think um, with this team specifically, the camaraderie will will be there because a lot of the guys are coming back, like a lot of core pieces are coming back. You know, you got obviously Taman, Jiggy, um, Keyshawn, Keyshawn. You got Milan, Milan. Conrad Holly. Yep, Conrad Holly and Cade Kellerman, I think will be huge um kind of undervalued. I think so this is from like an athlete's perspective. To me, there's a lot of times people sort of like roll their eyes by saying like the last guy on the end of the bench is really important to the culture of a team. Um so this is a little bit of an opportunity to kind of present flowers as much as I mean, he's probably the most beloved end of the bench guy that exists in college basketball, a CEO and you know, whatever. Because I, I, I feel like, what's the saying? You're, you're only as good as your weakest link. Right. But also, as a motivational thing... That's not that's not a, a shot at uh, Holly either. So I mean, just... Conrad, he's, please. He's, pr- he's probably not as good at basketball as Taman. Well, uh, you can probably say that. Uh, but when you're... If you're a guy who's sort of middle of the pack... Now, I think the, the advantage that this team has... And so last year, you have guys like, I would say, Bob Jones and Taman were probably the leaders of the team where, when in doubt... Um, you know, something goes wrong. Who are, I don't know, you, you break a window. You're ha- you're out hanging out with your buddies. Uh, you're playing baseball. Someone hits a home run or whatever. Foul ball goes through a window. Who is everybody looking at in that moment to go, uh, what do we do? And it feels like even if it's not you listen to me, we're doing this. That type of attitude was, was probably Bob Jones and Taman. Like that to me is leadership. It's not necessarily that you're dictating what everyone's doing. It's just that everyone implicitly trusts you with the decision and to be the role model of what behavior we want. And when the front of your, the top of your roster, your most talented, your, your most key contributors, the guys that have the ball a lot, Taman, last year, Robert Jones, I think Keyshawn and Curtis Jones and, and Milan are going to be guys like that. Uh, I, when those guys are, I mean, Taman being probably the, the big dog this year, and I would probably say between you know the three guards, uh, they're the ones that are going to be setting the energy and setting the tone. When they're, when the top of your roster works really hard, that's when you have like Brock and Brees. When those guys are working as hard as they do, you go, or David Montgomery, really the culture setter for the football program, saying if the best player on our team is working that hard, in order to be the best, I have to work that hard too. But at the same time, if the bottom of your roster doesn't also work that hard or doesn't work at least near that hard, if they're not, if Taman's the first one in the door at 6.01 a.m. and the, the person that's at the very last end of the bench isn't there at 6.01 or 6.02 or 6 o'clock, then there can be a sagging off where a bunch of the uh, the the tag-alongs just glom together. We're not playing. Eeyore, woe is me. I'm sad. Blah, blah, blah. If, that, if the bottom is allowed to be a bottom, then the guys that are in the middle will have to choose either I'm going to work hard and be towards the top of the pack or I'm going to take the easy way out and sag down and be with the back. And I think I there think, is no back I because of guys too, like Conrad Hawley. But I, I think too, and not, not trying to divert from what you're saying, but I think with some of Coach Rhodes' teams, we saw that. Yeah, some, we did. Some cancer, if you will, yeah. that, that snuck in and, and the, the bad culture started to take over. And it uh, happened. Uh, yep. Yeah. I mean, happened. and it, when you do that, then it is an easy choice. Guys that don't have like a really strong, whether it's a really strong upbringing or really strong role models or really, he- you know, know exactly what they need to do. It's an easier choice to be a little lazy, to be, to back talk, to kind of be like, oh, woe is me. I'm not playing as much as I want. That's way easier. It's way harder to get there early, to start putting up, putting up extra shots, knowing that you're never going to play or you're yeah. very, rare, very, very, very rarely going to play. And so guys at the end of the bench that almost literally sit at the very, very end of the bench with like Holly and Kelderman, when those guys are there at the same time as Taman, carrying themselves in the same way that Taman is, there is no other option. There is no back half. And it feels like that culture, you could spread that across pretty much all four of the major sports that we're talking about. But guys like Holly and Kelderman being the end of the bench, and that's why guys like Omaha, like imagine it, uh, imagine last year if 
uh, Kelderman and Holly were sort of like, woe is me, guys. A guy like Omaha, who wasn't playing as much as he wanted to, is freshman, doesn't know what college basketball is actually like. Well, if these guys are on the team who are complaining and these guys are also on the team who are working really hard, I'm not playing. I'm just going to hang out with these guys. But again, there is no choice. So it feels like you're talking about the culture. It feels like that's what culture is. So it's not a, it's a, it's not a small thing that guys like Holly and Kelderman are back to be the, to make the bottom of the roster's energy the exact same as the top of the roster's energy. You know what they say? What? A rising tide lifts all boats. There you go. Um, I also noticed too that you know JT Rocky obviously was on campus this last year. Should have been a, a senior in high school this last year, but was a uh, freshman redshirting. I think that's going to benefit him greatly. He was also behind the bench um, and was a huge cheerleader as well, too. You know, he was right behind uh, Holly and, and Kelderman, and, and he was standing up and cheering, too, which is something you need. And it's good that that culture got instilled with him, instilled into him from the get-go. Yeah, I think that's a strength. So, obviously, defense is going to be a strength. Uh, I camaraderie. Think I think camaraderie, camaraderie is, is a strength. Yeah. And I think uh, offensively, a thing that this team is going to be really good at is just being a diversified offense. Unselfish, I'd say. Yeah, so you have between – I mean – Keyshawn is probably the most quote ball heavy guard that you'd have sure. where his he not necessarily he doesn't need a certain amount of shots, but Taman is much more facilitator. Keyshawn is much more get to the rim. I mean, both play fairly similar, fairly similar ball. But when when Keyshawn Gilbert is the most ball dominant guard and he's not a super ball dominant guard, then that means your roster is very unselfish. If on one, I think we saw it through a good portion of the year is that there might be a game where. Hassan is the leading scorer with 16 or Taman is leading scorer with 26. And then Milan goes off for 24. And the next one is Keyshawn. It's not like there's one guy who's consistently in front of the roster. And if you have a person like uh, Caitlin Clark and Audie Crooks who can consistently do that, great. But those people are super, super rare to be that much better than everybody around them. Like Audie Crooks, the reason why she's going to get as much attention as she will, like LeBron was talking about her last week. The reason she's getting as much attention as she is and will continue to is because she is that much better than everybody else. It takes a lot to be up there. So I think this men's team is built around guys where you have a bunch of dudes that are A minus players or B plus A minus players or better, but none of them care to be the, the dude that scores all the points. So I think one of their strengths, both it, it offensively, is the fact that at any moment, any one of them could go off for 20 or 25 especially if you add whoever the wings that you're expecting, plus uh, Noyus, the the new freshman. Oh, he's going to be like so dirty. Milan, Kurt Jones. I mean, all these guys have the capacity to go off for 25, and you as a defense don't know who to particularly put your attention towards. And and I love that too because, you know, we saw that going into, uh, you know, tournament season where, you know, Taman got a lot of the a lot of the highlights for being up for defensive player of the year. A lot of guys were really good at defense though, but you see, you know, Kansas has a guy. Baylor's got a guy. You know, there's so many teams. You know, Houston's got a guy. Iowa State, they, you know, when they talk about Iowa State, they don't talk about, oh, Iowa State's got this one guy. Because like you said, there's so many guys who could go off any given night that they're such a team and unselfish. That's that's really a strength because like you said, you, you can't you can't hone in on you know, like a Clark. Everyone knows that Kalen Clark's going to go off for Iowa. So you hone in on her. Where you can you can shut Taman down. Okay, well, we got four other guys that could go off. Probably five or six other guys could go off any given night, which I think is huge. That they're playing team ball and uh yeah like you said you can't just stop one guy because other guys can hurt you well i think so which the other side of this like the weakness of it which it's hard to tell down the road like this upcoming season but i would say the thing that this roster struggled with is having a shooter who can consistently get his shot that's how i'm saying consistency that's the thing the cons and really it's consistent shooting because like Taman and Keyshawn could pretty much always get to the rim Except you know, a couple times, maybe like eight minutes or ten minutes out of a game, Keyshawn would try too hard at forcing a shot, or Taman would try too hard at getting to the rim or whatever. Uh, but having a guy like when Taman or Milan were on this year, or when Kurt Jones was on this year, and you can just give him the ball, go to town. I think that was that happened some, but it didn't happen like when something like th this year. So you. Uh, the, we're we're recording this before the men's national title game between UConn and Purdue. Uh, Purdue has obviously Zach Eady, who everything funnels through him. UConn doesn't quite have that. They have a couple guys though, who no matter what, like Caravan is the one that that kind of comes to mind, and then Tristan Newton. They've got a nice nuke. 
Nuke. Back to the B reference of of Tristan Newt Newton. Newton. No, yep. No. Uh, no pun intended. Newton Caravan and and, uh, and and Donovan McClingan. So like you have those guys who at any moment, hey, we haven't hit a shot in five possessions. Who do we get the ball to to just get us out of like uh, the Zay Brockington back when it prior to teams realizing that he was that guy when Isaiah Brockington or George Niang uh, when those guys when you have those guys in the roster you obviously don't need them every night and Audie Crooks you don't need them every night to go off for 30 but a guy who you can consistently just get the ball to when you're in a rut so they can kind of take the rim the, the lid off the rim and keep you in a game when when a team like Illinois goes on a run is it going to be 12 to 2 or is it going to be a 6-0 run and then you go hey guys let's get it to Zach Eady and Eady's either going to get fouled he's going to they're going to double team he's going to find the guy or find the the open shooter or he's going to take it to the rim and we're we're going to stop this run at 6 to 2 and not let it be 12 to 2 and i think that's what this team didn't have and i don't know if they will have it and that's not saying they won't it's just literally saying I don't know. You would assume that Milan's going to get better and take the jump between year one and year two that Taman did. You'd assume that Keyshawn's going to become a better shooter. You would assume that uh, Kurt is going to be more confident coming into the year than he was last year, and so he'll kind of be able to continue this. And then is there another guy who, whether it's Deshaun Jackson, what like you don't know that somebody who you can just say we're up, they're on a six zero run. Give the ball to XYZ, go to town. I think that's the potential weakness, and I don't know if it is a weakness because we don't know what the roster is going to be. I would call those a slump buster. Yeah. Yeah, shout out, B. Um, so I, I think at towards the end of the year, Jiggy was maybe our slump buster. Yeah. Um, you know, er, earlier on in the season, I wouldn't say that he was as much of a slump buster, but he definitely he just wasn't his, as consistent or yeah, confident. Yeah, he, and he had his confidence, you know, towards, towards the end of the year. Um but yeah, I, I would say, you know, and I don't know if he'll start next year or not. I think he should. I mean, he deserves starter minutes. But I, I think you're having two or three slump busters, which is obviously ideal. And that's, yeah, that's why UConn is as good as UConn is, is yep. because they've got at least three. I think, honestly, when I was when you're watching Caravan, Caravan is what Milan should grow into. Yeah. He's a six eight six nine. 6'9". Yeah. He's really physical where Milan can get there. He's not, Milan right now isn't quite as physical, but if Milan ever develops that, like, Imagine if Milan played with the same physical physical capacity that Trey King did, like that same type of like being able to bully you off a position, just so he can, dude. Yeah, so we can just get to his spot. I want to be, I want to hit my this turnaround jumper from the elbow. Get out of the way. I'm getting the elbow, like that type of physical. That's that's what Caravan plays with. Yeah. And you know, Donovan McClingan seven two. Well, JT Rock's also seven two. I'm not saying that he's JT Rock going to be Donovan McClingan, but in the same way, if you got to do the seven two with an offensive skill set that you can just, hey. I'm going to throw it 12 feet up in the air where only you can catch it and you can hit a, sh a hook shot from seven feet out pretty much like 85% of the time, make that shot, go to town. And so when you have guys like that, a driver or several drivers, you have a guy who can hit floater, guys who can hit threes, that feels like this team could potentially remedy that from next year. And also the, the weaknesses that I think they're addressing are the guys they've picked up that are forwards all can shoot. We talked about this yeah. last time is that one of the things that was difficult is you have a roster, the, the construction of this roster last year was that you have some shooters, but predominantly it's a slash and pa slash and kick offense where Taman, Keyshawn, Kurt are going to drive and they're going to kick to find a shooter and maybe you're going to follow up, drive again, or maybe you're going to shoot a three from there. Well, if you have a, a five on the floor who is zero threat to shoot, then their big can just stay at the basket making that drive not near as much of a threat. So help doesn't have to help off of anybody because they know, hey, somebody's going to be in there. Whatever the dude from Baylor, he, he can just stay there. He's going to block that shot anyway. But having a guy like Rock, like Jackson, or like, uh, who's the, the guy? Chetfield. that they just signed, who all of them can shoot. Brant. Brant. Branton. So like oh. all those guys can shoot. And so if you then have them on the floor and they're 12, 18 feet off or seven, eight, seven feet off the block and they're not actually there, the five can't just leave them because when that driver gets down, if if that post, the defensive post rotates off of him, Keyshawn kicks it to him, hits a little elbow jumper or a little 12 foot shot, goes in. All of a sudden, you have to keep helping off it. So I think that's another thing that this team has done. So I thought that they, they didn't have as many slump busters as you want, and they didn't have big guys that can shoot. And it feels like they're going to either they're going to develop the slump busters and they've recruited in from the transfer portal guys that bigs that can shoot. Yep. No, I agree. And I think, um, 
if we're gonna make good time here, we probably move on to the next team here soon. But let's talk about what the uh, upside downside. Yeah. So I th- yeah. So I think uh, I think the upside for this team. Let's talk about downside first. Um, I think the the floor for the team I would say is um, second weekend. Second weekend. Yeah. I mean, I, I I wouldn't. I mean, Sweet Sixteen is is. Yeah, and and that's so they, sh- they should. I mean, they should expect to be there because like they, they'll, they'll probably be. A, a top three seed again next year if yeah. all things go how it should. And now you, you know, this this downside part, it's assuming that like, and this isn't just spe- specifically with this team, but like if if there's a major injury, like when Niang broke his foot in the what, 2016 tournament, yeah. whatever it was, like obviously that's a thing you can't control and you know, that's that's bad. So assuming something catastrophic, catastrophic like that, just taking that off the table is if everything more or less stays together, the reasonable expectation can be that this team makes it to the second weekend. I think that is... Anything less than that would be like Jesus. What happened? I agree. That feels like this. The, the men's team feels like second weekend. A Sweet Sixteen strength roster feels like the expectation. Like well, like a a Duke or a Kansas. You know, in in most years, when Kansas makes it to the tournament, if they get bounced early in the first or second round, you're like, what happened? That's what this roster has the strength of being. So I think the second weekend feels like the floor. Of reason within reasonable expectations for this roster this year, the expectations are gonna be super high this year too because I've seen one way too early release where they've got Iowa State ranked number two. I've seen another one where they were three, so like they'll be. I mean, they'll be top ten for sure, probably for probably, sure top five. Yeah, pr- I mean, it should be top five. And if you is, look at the conference, the Big Twelve is gonna be strong again, and it, but I think it's gonna be fairly top heavy. They're also gonna add in I mean, Arizona. Arizona yeah. yeah, so Arizona is gonna be one of the top schools kansas is obviously going to be one of the top schools baylor's obviously going to be one of the top schools well coach dependent yep coach dependent coach Let's, dependent a little smoke in the water out there and then uh um houston you would assume that kelvin sampson's going to reload kansas too yeah kansas arizona baylor houston iowa state yep. those it feels like those five are, are going to be jockeying for like all of them uh, uh, their their goal would be a one seed those yes. five have reasonable goals of being a one seed yeah, I agree. And I think there's other teams that could be sprinkled in there, but I think those five will probably be... Like a TCU, like a we, like a West Virginia. I mean, Oof, I forgot with, about that. again, with Darren DeVries, Tucker DeVries going there, they've got a big war chest of people that could be there. I think they could be a lot better. Uh, Carissa Kerr entered the transfer portal. He, he so. did not. He is not today. Yep. So, yep. But, uh, uh, but Tuck, Tuck, it'd be fun to see how Tucker does there. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a lot different in the Big 12. Yeah. Texas Tech, too. I mean, they, I think they yeah. can surprise some people, too. But, like, that feels like the, the, the five teams that are... You know, again, Arizona was a two seed this year. Kansas is Kansas. They had an off year and they were a five seed, six, five, five. I think, yeah. And then Iowa State was a two and BYU Baylor, was a six. Baylor was a three and Houston was a one. BYU kind of got Iowa State's number two. So they were six. Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know who they lose. I hope they lose everybody. And I don't know if they're going to have the, so the, the team, I mean, again, the, the, and the upside, honestly, we can just kind of very quickly, yeah. the upside for this team is a national championship. Like it, all things held together, they realistically could do that. Now, yeah. There's only one team out of 300 and some that makes it there. So to expect that that's going to happen is a little bit, it's putting a lot of eggs in a basket where if you're disappointed at anything less than that, you're like, okay, that's, that's shooting a little too high. But to expect that it could happen is a reasonable thing. Like it reminds me of, uh, so Cal, Colin Klein, not Calvin Klein, Calvin Klein, Colin Klein, different people. Uh, Colin Klein, he went through a goal setting mechanism that he uses, which I really like. I don't formally declare them in this way, but he uses one as sort of like the top level is if everything I do goes right, then and everything happens in the best way possible, this is what I'm shooting for. And for him, it was a Heisman Trophy. And then the next one is here's what I can control. And if I do everything that I can control, then I'm going to be a first team all Big 12 player. And then below that is the acceptable goal. If I put in the effort that I feel confident with, but things don't go my way, then I'm going to be uh, an honorable mention, all Big 12, and I'm we're going to win, you know, eight games or something like that. So it's tier one, tier two, tier three. It feels like Iowa State in that kind of tier one, tier two, tier three is win the national championship. Next one's make a final four, and the next one's make the elite eight. And then anything below that would be a failure to meet your goals, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a failure of a season. So like if it's a sweet 16 team and they don't get farther than that, it's three sweet sweet 16s in four years. Pretty damn cool. Got to get but, past that though. But it feels like they've got, a, go, at least right now, it feels like the ceiling is higher. So to me, it feels like that's your national championship is that that quote Heisman goal. 
Below that would be a final four. And those are things that if you control what you can control, that is very within your grasp. Yeah, I wouldn't say I've got all my eggs in the basket of national championship, but I got if I got 24 eggs, I probably got about 20 of them in there. <laughs> I would say 80% of the eggs that are and in the basket. And I would say pro- probably three of them are in the final four, and then just one, one, elite elite egg. Yeah. one elite egg. Nope. Egg, egg elite. I'm not going to allow the that. The egg elite eight. Not going to allow that. Uh, I think so. That it feels like that team has of the four, uh, of the four teams that we're going to be talking about, that team has the highest ceiling. Honestly, we can kind of, I don't know, wrestling is going to be a shorter discussion, but it feels like of the next ones, wrestling feels like the next highest ceiling. Yeah. If, if Penn State could go on and get, they'd well, be a lot higher, but <laughs> Penn State's just, they're so good, man. They graduate a lot. God, they they lose, they lose a good amount. I, re- I rented a house from Kale in college. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. I can tell you more about the story off camera, but yeah. Um, rented a, my, my final semester, rented a house from him. Uh, Did you have to wrestle him for park. rent? You have to fight him for rent? No, it wasn't actually him. It, it was some guy that managed managed it for him, but ah. Kale owned the house. Ah. Yeah, I'll tell you more about, about him after after the show. Sorry, listeners. Uh, so like wrestling, like I said, this is sort of a, 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 a little bit of a quicker discussion because the season so far often, their transfer portal is still wide open and one or two wrestlers makes a huge difference. The strength... How, that, many, how many weights are there? 10. Okay. So the strengths that the wrestling team has is that there isn't really the in the past and and Aiden you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong on this one so they qualified nine weights to nationals out of 10 so 90% of your roster is good enough to make it to the national tournament was was Broderson it was 97 was the only one that we that that Iowa State didn't qualify somebody for so you have nine out of 10 weights so the strength that this team has is that there isn't really a bad weight and you'd assume that they're going to fix that hole so it's not like you can expect to qualify 10 out of 10, but again, that high level goal, I think there's at least two to three guys that have a legit national title shot. Like Etchemendia and Yonger are going to go in as probably, Yonger's going to be the number one seed or number one ranked wrestler coming into next year at heavyweight. Etchemendia is probably top three, Aiden, you think? Yeah. Top three, top, top five. five for sure. Top three, top five. But look, if you're and in the top... Like Casey Swiderski is probably a dark horse to Yeah, be... I mean, he'll... Should be an all American next year. Frost, Frost, I he needs think, a little. He needs to hit the weight room a little bit more. But see, but he hung with Dayton Fix. Yeah, and I get Dayton Fix. You know, first time, four time, yeah, runner up, whatever. Feels like he's kind of the next guy up in terms of, you know, he could be a guy to win the national championship. So yeah. you're looking at so younger possibly younger should be ex- guys younger should be expected to win. Compete. It'd be surprising if younger doesn't win. Like this year, it was surprising that he did not make the title. Can I just say we got to get a camera on you, Aiden, for whenever you talk. Just have you just sorry. Aiden's face just pop right in the middle. Of you know what's funny though is that like uh Aiden's view from my perspective is like Wilson from Home Improvement, where I only see his eyes ever. Like I don't see anything below that his, was my childhood bridge of his show, nose. Man. That was my childhood uh-huh. show. Yeah. Uh uh-huh. so anyway, like the the strength that this Al Borland the strength, name that would <laughs> the strength that this roster has is that there isn't a bad weight. Because I think they're probably going to fill that hole. And I also think that the strength is that you can have a couple guys that it, come tournament time are going to succeed really well. Like Younger, like Etchemendia, like Frost, like Swiderski. Um, I think and Iowa State gets uh, Panero Johnson back after the year-long suspension. And that thing is weird. You so can they, bet he's ready to go. You can bet he's ready to go. But like he was an All-American. And then he had to miss out on a year. And he's going to have to t- get back in shape. And there's going to have to be a way to find him in. You lose David Carr who is arguably the best wrestler. Well, no, our, there's a lot of guys. Like the guy at, He's top one, five the guy sure. at 197. At, was it Brooks at 197, the four-time champ? That dude's a yeah, monster. Aaron Brooks. Yeah, that dude's a monster. I think he's the best wrestler at all weights. They had two four-time... Penn State had two four-time national Yeah, it was champions. like going into that night, there was only six of them, I think, all time. And they had, and they had seven and eight in the same team. Two. Jeepers. Wild. Uh, but they're gone, right? They're gone. See ya. But anyway, they're going to reload with somebody else who's... Probably not necessarily as good. But probably yeah, close. it really doesn't matter who leaves Penn State. Yeah, they're just continuing to be good. Anyway, like the car is gone, but then you get Panero Johnson back, and he's probably between him and Chittam and Swiderski are going to be like in the one somewhere in the one fifties, one sixties, whatever weights yeah, they, they shake they into. Have a lot to figure out between those guys going one forty nine, fifty seven, and sixty five. Yeah. So. so at some, those three are probably going to fall in that line somewhere, and then you just somebody's going to fill in at one ninety seven. Did they get a? Did they get a transfer for one ninety seven? Anyway. The do, strength, they, do they I don't have, think I've gotten anyone yet. Do they have a 181? Uh, you got to have probably wrestled at least some. I've got 
one year left uh, of eligibility. I'm a COVID year. Hey, uh, well, weighed in at 181 this uh, this morning. So beef. Yeah, I'm an ankle biter. Beef. Um, I'll suplex. Yeah. You know what's funny though? You would you would have to be in the third heaviest. You'd have to wrestle 84. You'd be in the third heaviest weight class. Bring it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I'm the, flexible, man. So I think what's the ceiling for this? I the the Iowa State wrestling team. I think runner up is a reasonable ceiling. Like finishing second behind Penn State. Penn State's just so goddamn good. We're, we're, they finished second this year, right? They finished fourth. Four, well, yeah, second, second's second. So very real. second, and and they weren't that far and, off. Yeah, of second. Panero, or sorry, not Panero. Younger, y- younger wins what he's if if younger wins to win. if if he wins if he just gets to the semi or even just gets to the final doesn't if he has win a the normal, final a normal if he, finger. if he yeah if he doesn't have a finger that's broken and bent sideways like then Iowa State gets second I think that feels like a reasonable expectation and to I wouldn't say beat Penn State but like push Penn State a little bit that it's not a completely foregone conclusion that Penn State's going to win by the largest margin in the history of collegiate wrestling that shouldn't be the case because Iowa State should be better. So I think that's a thing that you can look forward to. The floor, they're going to be, I, I think a, they are reasonably going to be top five. I think the a fifth place finish feels like the the floor for this wrestling team going they, into next year. They should come in ranked top five, right? Because they return everyone. I think they're going to come in two, maybe three. Oh. Iowa's probably two. I think Penn State's one for sure. Iowa's probably two and Iowa State's three, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's probably realistic. Because Iowa's going to have some guys come back too. And Ooh, they're going to get a bunch of transfers. If Iowa and, State beats Iowa this year, because Iowa State hasn't beat Iowa in a while. In a long time. Not since. It's going to be at uh, Carver. Two or something. I think that'd be fun. Man, beating Iowa at Carver. That'd be good. Cyclones get your mind right. Ooh, ooh. I also think that uh, Tom Brands over at I- over in Iowa City has probably heard from the administration that you better get your shit together. Because the standard for Iowa wrestling is to not get smoked by Penn State in everything. And the fact that they've actually gotten worse, they've had less All-Americans, they've had less champions in the past like three or four years consistently. I think the standard at Iowa, it'd be sort of like if Alabama won eight games three years in a row, that you'd be like, what's going on at Alabama? It's the same thing with Iowa wrestling. I think Brands is probably getting a little breath down his neck. The downfall of Iowa. hate yeah, to see that'd it. Be, that'd Quack. be too rough. Ducks. Uh, okay, so moving on from the wrestling team. I think the next fun program we can kind of we'll finish with football and just kind of talk women's basketball cliffhanger women's basketball. That is, man, that's going to be, this is going to be fun, man. They, so I think they, they lose Bellinger Naidu are really the two main contributors that only two that, the, well, and then Jalen Bristow, Jalen transferred. Bristow transferred. Yeah. So they lose, they lose. Uh, is, is not, not a boo. Just entered the portal. It's oh, she of, did. Ah, Okay, so, well, that's probably because she's not going to get as many minutes as. And there was another girl that didn't really play that entered. Uh, Mary Kate King, she was a. Uh, walk on, an, on another girl. Or anyway, just didn't, what, didn't contribute yeah, yeah. as much. So like of contributing members, Mary so Kate was a, she was a favorite of the band though. The one game I went to, they were chanting uh, to get her in. She's a short girl, you know. Just loves loves life. Uh, so but but the main nucleus con- of contributors is there. They are going to need another because Audi da- is going to get in foul trouble. So you need another big. But transfer portal's open. I'm sure there's another window that you can get at some point, and some coach is going to leave, and then you can pick up. So they're going to need a backup five. But they also did bring in the gal from Johnston who won the three point shooting contest. Yep, uh, Ali Tanky, I think her name. Is her, I don't know if it's Ali or Ailey. It's Tank or Tanky. Um, Probably not Ailey. I have a cousin named Ailey. Really? Yes. It's, Odd name? It's spelled, it's Irish. Uh, ah. my, my cousin's is A-I-L-E-Y. This, ah. this girl's name is Ailey. A-I-L-I. Ailey. So if it's A-L-E. Could be. Or Ally. Either way, and the last name is Tanky, T-A-N-K-E. So Tank, Tanky, whatever. She just won, I think, the national uh, three-point. High point. school, yeah. National high school three-point shooting contest from Johnston. Pretty cool, yeah. So she can stroke it from deep. And um, so need that, that. And that replaces Bellinger, because that was the thing. Talk yep. about a slump buster. Yep. I mean, the thing that the women's team had that the men's team kind of didn't quite have as much of is something goes wrong, give it to Audie or give it to Bellinger and let him shoot. Or right. Addie Brown at times. Or Addie Brown at times too. And a lot of times they're the four would just sag off and wouldn't be able to play with it. Wouldn't be able, wouldn't be able to stay on a three point line with her, but like they've got slump busters. And now the thing that I think they need to be able to develop is def- I think their defense needs to be able to improve specifically with, Audi Crooks and whoever's going to be playing that five, because if they can with as, as physical as Audi is, we're like, she is strong. She's a shot put and discus nat- or state champ, like strong in addition to just being a large human being. So if you're that big, again, using Zach Eady as an example, or Donovan Klingon, I think Klingon in the sweet 16 game had 
eight blocks? If you have eight blocks, do you think the opposing team is going to even think about driving anywhere near where you're at? No, but the, the an impressive thing, and not to get on uh, a tangent about UConn, is um, and I'm not I'm not going to get into Bethy about uh, Klingon and Edie. I think Klingon is a lot more athletic than Edie. Mm-hmm. I think Edie gets most Agreed. of most yeah. his blocks at the rim, whereas Klingon is. Uh, he's he's going to help. Yeah, he's able he's, to help off. He's quicker. He's more athletic, and he he is more um, not prone. I don't think is the right word, but he is going to block um, not just at the hoop, but he's also going to block jump shots as well too. So. But um, like someone like I don't think Crooks is going to have the same type of Donovan Klingon movement, but a Zach Eady impact where she's not quite as tall proportionally as Eady is. But in the same way that when you drive against Purdue, you're driving into a sequoia tree that like you you have to account for the fact that he's there. And even if you're even if he's because he has to he played 40 minutes in the final four game. So he keeps himself out of foul trouble by just being straight up and down and trusting the fact that if you can make a layup over 10 foot outstretched arms into a 10 foot hoop, good on you. But like if Audie can do that and just abide sort of by the Zach Eady mold where I'm physical and you know that I'm here and be able to play defense in that way and then also have the guards be as aggressive like Ariana Jackson, like uh, a Kelsey Jones, like Emily, an Emily Ryan. Ryan. Emily Ryan killed it in the, the, the last game that they yeah. had. And so if you have that, on the defensive end and the defense can improve and and uh Addie Brown can do that and also stay out of foul trouble and like and if if Jones can stay you know she got hurt obviously didn't yeah. play the last game so she's obviously she's she's a good three point shooter too and she'll she'll take a jump too from her freshman to sophomore year as well. Yeah I think just being able to have better consistent defense because I, their offense is gonna be so damn good. Like just with as much attention really it it is watching Purdue is like gonna be watching the, Purdue is the men's version of what Iowa State's women's team is going to be next year. Now, obviously, that's not saying they're going to make, make the national title game, but like with as efficient as you can be with Audie Crooks on the post and her shooting and scoring ability, and then her ability to pass out of that, like that slump buster. It's hard to go on a run against a team like that, and especially with the thing that Purdue does really well is they've got a supporting cast that can shoot. So you got any one of the four dudes that are on the floor with Edie, all of them can make a three. So if you double off of him, he's going to find that shooter. There you go. He, he's going to end up with eight assists, and all of them are going to be on three point shots. And, and I, I don't, I don't know. We, we Iowa State also is going to have Alyssa Williams, who the transfer from from LSU, LSU who's six yeah. two, um, who she's going to, you know, probably I don't know if if, if like her, a four and a half. Yeah, I'm not sure if her and Audie play the same position, but she is a a, a big that you know Iowa State could we, we could use. Um, so I, I don't know what kind of game she brings to it, but six two girl coming from LSU is. Probably got to be good. Probably, yeah. And so I think like with the ceiling and floor, the upside downside on the women's team, it feels like the downside, it's similar. The downside feels like similar to the men's team where if Iowa State's women's team doesn't make a sweet 16, I'd be surprised. Yeah, I would agree. Because assuming that the, the season goes as you would expect it to, the women's game still for the next year, I, I don't see any like immediate way of changing it. First two games are at Hilton. That's true. Like, if you're a top four seed, the first two games are at your home site. Iowa State will very likely, at least in my opinion, that means you're one of the 16 best teams in the country. They're going to start right around there or inside of there. Yeah. If you just execute them... I, I think they'll start a top, as, as a top 20 team, and then obviously as the girls grow, that I think they'll yeah. probably finish with the top so 15. So you would assume that you're going to be a top four seed, and I think yep. that's what you would expect. Then the first two games are at Hilton. If you can't win two games at Hilton with that roster, I would be surprised. Now, and, granted, yeah, and, and the fans are going to come out, obviously. Oh, for sure. It's going to be sellout for both those games. So I think that, for me, it feels like the for, the same thing. The floor or the downside within reasonable expectations, obviously, make the tournament. If they don't make the tournament, something really fell off the wheels or off the wagon. But by the time, I think within reasonable expectations, a second weekend. Do I think they're a national championship team? Probably not. But I don't know. Like, upside feels like Elite Eight, Final Four-ish. If they do, if they piece together all the things and and Crooks and Brown and Jackson and that group of young players t- and Jones takes the step forward that we kind of expect them to, it feels like that's a reasonable thing. Like when you watch all the other Elite Eight teams play, like, uh, I mean, Texas and Iowa State played and didn't they, they were what, one and two against them this year? Didn't they beat Texas once? Yeah. Uh, or they lose Texas. They they beat Baylor twice. Yeah, they, that's what it was. I don't think they beat that's Texas what it was. this year. But like the that level to me feels like where you could reasonably, if you were to swap Iowa State in and make them a little bit better with a little bit of experience, it feels like that to me. The floor for this team 
or the downside is Sweet 16. Upside's like Final Four, Elite Eight ish, if everything goes right. And and that's not even playing into you know whoever Iowa State brings in, you know, because obviously right. there's there's what three or four roster spots at least that they could bring in. We'll say two, you know, at the very minimum uh, of transfers. So yeah, uh, it's an exciting time. So let's uh, let's let's move on to the to to the men's football team. Um, the men's football team at Iowa State College. Yes, at of edu- the, uh, education the Ames. and at the engineering. Ames. So, you know, obviously with the men's football team, um, I didn't mean to do it that time. <laughs> um, they're, they're returning a you lot. You played yourself. They're, they're returning a lot. I think I saw something the other day that um, Iowa State's returning 19 starters. I think it's more than that. Oh, I don't know. I, I think it's more than that. I think they have the they have the capacity, I think, of returning. It's like 19 20. on offense and defense. But then you obviously you, know, you factor in uh, the perk by the pound, Tyler Perkins and long snapper. Mm-hmm. Um, Shackford's back. Um the kickers are back, but they didn't play. Um, yeah, you know, like I said, the, the football teams, yeah, not, and, no, no longer in a rebuilding year; they're in a reloading year. And this, and and you look at the the, the advantage that they have is that th- there's not really, I don't think, going to be a trash team in the conference. Hopefully, like, Kansas State, but they're going to be good. Yeah, you can't say it's going to be pretty good. Uh, and Kansas State's going to be really good. Um, I hope not. They will be probably. I hope we beat them again. I mean, that would be nice, but I don't think. I feel like gonna it's going to be in Ames. It's going to be in Ames. Uh, yeah, I, I don't expect them to lose. I'm just saying, like, Kansas State's going to be a minimum an eight win team. Quack. Them too. <laughs> uh, so, but like, there's no, I don't think there's going to be really awful teams in the conference. I don't think there's going to be any 2021 Kansas Jayhawks. Well, we we also bring in the like Arizona State. I don't think they're very good. I don't think they're going to be that bad, though. Like, they're true. not going to be a true doormat team. That's I think true. they won five games last year. So it's not like they're going With to be the a first year D- Dillingham or something. Yeah, their coach is awesome. Yeah. So they're not going to, they're not going to be a doormat. I think he there's going awesome. to be, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of coaches or not a lot of coaches, a lot of teams that are pretty good, but there's not any one team that is get out of the way. There's no Georgia Bulldogs in this, in the conference that is absolutely, it is their shot to lose. There's like seven teams that are going to be, in the conversation of being at the top. And Iowa State is very much on that short list of teams that are going to be towards the top of the conference. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't have their schedule pulled up in front of me, so I do apologize to listeners. But um, I think this year it's very realistic. I'm not trying to jump into the potential wins, losses, but I think it's very potential that this is a 10-win season if all things go well. But as far as some of the strengths for Iowa State, um, you know, obviously they return just about everyone on offense, everyone on defense. Um, I would say... I don't know. I mean, what would you say? Is is the offense stronger than defense or defense stronger than the offense? I think just the the complementary football. And I think when you have a guy like Rocco at quarterback and a running back tandem like Sama and Hanson, those two guys being the main ones that are toting the rock. Uh, the And then when you look at the offensive skill positions they have between Noel and Higgins and Bramer and uh, the, the rest of the, the kind of the transfers they brought in. There's don't a lot about of, bouncy Benny. Who? Benny Nagoya. He's going to be good. Oh, yeah, year. yeah. And uh, there's gonna be a lot of guys. It's true. Again. And uh, th- there's so there's so much. And Alston, the dude from Army, transfer from Army. There's so much depth. Er, there's so much consistency across what you're gonna do. So if you've got a like a, a team like Texas from last year, Iowa State couldn't run the ball on Texas. No one could run the ball on Texas. Well, if that's the case, there is like seven dudes that you could spread out and actually throw the ball and play a way wide open system in a way that. Washington played against Texas and Washington was able to advance the ball down the field a lot. They obviously won against Texas. They're able to do that because they could throw the ball and force Texas to back TF off. And then you're running against a five man box. Iowa state has the same capacity to do that because of all the depth and talent they have from Rocco all the way out. But you also have the ability with that running back group to run it right down someone's face if you need to. And so I, the, the question mark, and defensively, it's, I think it's going to be almost exactly the same team as last year, with everybody getting five to seven percent better. You know, except for Tampa, obviously. But we've got right. But then Darian Porter is going to step in. Jontez, Jontez is going to be able to step in. And you know, you don't have a lockdown top two or three round NFL draft pick necessarily, but you have other guys that are there. And I think a guy like Sturgis is going to be able to provide more depth in the secondary because that was one thing that that hurt Iowa State last year is if Freeler, Verdun, and or Cooper were hurt, then there is a substantial step back in the defensive capacity. I think there's more depth between Patton getting another year, Sturgis coming in and being able to fill a couple different roles. You want him to stay healthy. 
but somebody's going to get hurt. It just will. Like football's a game where you can't count on 100% of your roster making it to the end. There are collisions happening there every are co- play. Literally, you're trying to run into each other. So people are going to get hurt. So it feels like the depth of the defense is going to be even better than it was this year, both at linebacker, they lose Gary Vaughn, and that's it. Ever, all the rest of the linebackers come back. Every defensive lineman comes back, I'm pretty sure. Right? Do we lose anybody? Um, anybody in the 2D? Well, the guy that we, we didn't have him last year who was betting, but no. Yeah, Singleton. Or not Singleton, no, no, Isaiah no. Lee. Yeah, Isaiah Lee. No, Is but he, Singleton's back. Yeah. yeah, so everybody comes back in the defensive line, pretty sure. I mean, I might be missing somebody. Forgive me if I am. And then a secondary, you lose TJ Tampa, which is a big hit, but you return everybody else. Yeah. The entire two deep comes back except for like three guys. So the depth is way better on defense. The only thing that I would say is like a weakness is I don't know about the offensive line. It's not to say everyone that, comes back though. And and they add in the transfer from Princeton, who's gonna be a dog. He's on campus yet. Uh Brandon Black played last year, obviously, as a true freshman, which is in, yeah. crazy impressive to to think of. The, the kid from uh kid from Wisconsin, you know, he's playing at center and, and or guard. Office? Jim? No, Jim. Jim's playing at guard too. I saw Hufford was at center. No? They, they posted a picture today. Hufford, Hufford's at center. I feel like spring ball don't take any. Don't take no, too much. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Spring ball is you're but gonna that's you're gonna roll the dice and throw shit at the wall and see if it sticks. That's interesting though. You know, yeah. Hufford Hufford playing center. It would, um, it allows you more of an anchor because Jim is a is really. I we, I we did a professional thing up there. I talked to actually like James. I think it's James Neal and Jim Boniface were two of the most impressive humans to talk to. Like the people that if I was a company which we have one. They're just not anywhere in the a range of looking to get hired by us. If I was a company and they were wanting to get hired, those two are guys that I would instantly want to bring on my team. So if Jim Boniface or James Neal ask for a job at your company, take them up on that. They're very impressive people. But Jim is more of a technician and a guy like Hufford is, I'm a bench press 500 pounds and move grader. you out of the way. And if that's grader. at center, it's helpful to have that because then you can just move somebody when there is a nose guard you can bring help with a guard but you don't need help with a guard so i don't know it'd be could could be fun but also i i, I, I think, prioritize being smart at center over being a road grader it's if you can be both that's kind of nice yeah and it's nice that he's a fifth sixth year senior uh whatever it is but the, the line that they rolled out there which again this is not i'd be very surprised if this is the same lineup they roll out the first game versus north dakota or south dakota whichever it is south dakota it's the so yeah, it's South Dakota, not um, South Dakota State, just South Dakota. Yeah, right. No, North Dakota. Is it North Dakota? I think it's I think it's North, North Dakota. Dakota. Yeah. Just North Dakota. But the the, the roster they rolled out, the line they rolled out was um, Tyler Miller at left tackle, Jim left guard, Hufford center, Brennan Black right guard, and then James Neal right uh, right tackle. I doubt that's going to be the same. Yeah, I, w- I would imagine it's going to shake up a little this bit. Princeton guy that we got coming is is he, he's was one of the best tackles in the in the portal. We got him. So the just weakness slash question marks is the offensive line. If that can be a strength, this team's ceiling is extremely high Stupid because high. they're going to be good everywhere else. But yeah, well, I'm not saying the Prince guy. He, the Prince guy. He almost declared for the NFL draft last year. He, he's for sure NFL guy, which will be the first NFL. Assuming he goes to NFL, the first NFL offensive lineman that Iowa State has had since KO. KO for sure. I mean, Jake Campos had a cup of cup of coffee. Josh Kniffle. Josh Kniffle, also yeah, Josh Kniffle, yeah. coffee on a roster. But the last one drafted was probably... Oh, yeah, last one drafted. Was a, he was a second rounder, wasn't he? Yeah. Second rounder? So. Yeah, early second. Yeah, he was like 60th overall or something yeah. like that. But like that, it feels like it, that to me is the question mark is because you you have pretty good confidence that everywhere else... Because imagine just for the... for the If you want to bring a smile to your face, you have Rocco Becht intelligently delivering the ball like a Brock Purdy where I'm not going to be the show, but I'm going to make sure that everything stays on the rails. And the people you're throwing to, again, are Higgins, Noel, and then a guy, the the Western Michigan guy, uh, or Central Michigan guy transfer, who's like a little water bug. And then Ben Nagoyi and Ben Bramer. There's the guys you're throwing to. Alston, too, the, the, the transfer from, from, he's, from Army. He's he's built almost like Hakeem Butler. So you have the, that's who you're throwing to. You, have, you can turn around and run a zone read or a lead blocking with, uh, Steve O'Klotz handing off to Abu Sama and letting that be your offense. And if the offensive line can be above average to good, let alone great, then that offense is potentially the best in the conference. Like, not saying that it will be, but like it has the potential if that offense, if that offensive line can execute at a level that is good to great, that is that, that has the potential of being the best offense in the conference. Will they? I don't know. I mean, really, it's not saying that it's going to happen, but it will 
it is very minimally a top half offense uh, for sure with a good offense with the offensive line playing to what the standard of the rest of the positions are that's a top t- one to three offense in the conference it's also it's gonna be interesting too to see how um uh, mauser calls them you know I've, I've heard everything i've heard from spring balls that mauser's gonna open it up they're gonna throw more throw deep more which i i have been banging this drum since 2017 that and I'm not I'm not putting all my eggs in, in one basket of folks focusing on one game. It's not our Super Bowl, the Iowa game. The the one year that Iowa State 2017, they should have beaten Iowa. They were launching it deep, launching it deep, launching it deep, taking the top off the defense. Should have beat them, and then they got conservative in the, in the fourth quarter and ended up losing. I would absolutely love it if we were not quite an air raid, but going deeper. We didn't really go deep at all last year. Well, I think if you threaten so to speak, he's also a true freshman. Which, thinking specifically about Iowa. Uh, when you the way that they play their defense is they play, it's they have like two coverages. Like they don't really do a bunch different. They just do what they do really freaking well. And what it is, it's it's like a cover two, cover four hybrid where they're going to play their two deep safeties behind everything. Their corners are going to drop underneath whatever. If there's a vertical, they're going to carry a vertical. Meaning, if a guy, a wide receiver is running straight down the field, they're going to carry that vertical. Uh, and if that happens and there's no other threat, the safety will come down to kind of rotate towards that side because now the corner is the deepest player, and that safety then doesn't have a deep threat, so he can play underneath, and that's why they jump so much stuff. Like that Castro, I mean, Castro's a, he's an outside linebacker, safety kind of nickel guy. He'd jump, jump underneath stuff. They have linebackers that play underneath hook curl. They have uh, middle linebackers going to drop straight down, but they can rotate who goes underneath. But because they play behind everything, that's their first responsibility because if you get beat on the edge, you have a safety or a, a linebacker. You're going to trust that a, someone's going to make that tackle. But if you miss and play short and someone throws it over your head, ball game. That's a touchdown. So they their res, first corner's first responsibility is to play deeper than everything and then drive on anything if there isn't a deep threat. Do that three or four times where you actually catch a deep ball. You force them down the field and catch one. You that's the Hakeem Butlers, the Alan Lazards. You yep. catch a 35, 40 yard pass. Then when you go to block as a wide receiver, one of the biggest threats that you have is scaring the shit out of a corner is just haul ass for the first 10 yards, push him into a back pedal, make him think that you're going to run by him and then settle down. Scoop. One of the reasons why I was so good at stopping the run is when they have guys like Cooper DeGene who play like a linebacker is if you don't force him backwards and he plays at the line of scrimmage, he tackles like a linebacker. That's why he's going to be a top 20 pick in the NFL. Is a guy like that needs to be scared out of playing anything deep. So if Iowa State is able to throw the ball down the field successfully to Higgins, to Jalen Knoll, uh, to the guy from Army, whoever it is, if, if you can throw it down the field consistently, you force their corners back, which means their run defense gets shaken up a lot. And then you get much more one-on-one opportunities with Sama or Hanson or whoever the ball carrier is on a safety in space without a corner pressing everything in. So, like, if they're able to throw the ball down the field, they can kick the not, not beat up Iowa, but you can start because that Iowa defense is so freaking good. Yeah, but you good. can you can crack them by th- pushing them deep. So, like, yeah, if they're able to throw the ball down the field, sure, darn tootin', do it. So, it's gonna break teams like Iowa if yep. you're able to do that. I would say it's gonna be so deep at, at receiver though and tight end this year that. They could line up, no one in the backfield, and just pew, pew, pew. yeah, and and you and could, you would trust be... you would trust Rocco to do that. And yes. think about this way: so Sam is a true tailback, like he's not going to be playing a slot. Hanson could play as a slot receiver. You could run a an eleven personnel, one tight end, one running back with Hanson and Bramer, and go five wide on one play, five wide on another play, still run four wide in the next play, and bring Hanson into the backfield, then run uh a fullback Bramer as a fullback on the next play and have Higgins be sort of an attached because he's six, three two twenty of brick muscle, have him as sort of like a nub tight end. And it almost looks like 12 personnel or, or even Alston coming from army who threw the ball four <laughs> times a game. I'm sure he probably blocks. Yeah, well. He probably can do that. So you have guys that you can flex in this offense. So, it, I mean, this, if the, the ceiling for this team is hosting a playoff game. I agree, and and I, I which think, is to win the Big Twelve. You win the Big Twelve, you host a playoff game. Because I don't know how many teams the Big Twelve will get. One for sure, two. two. So finish top two is pretty much in. Very, very much. Yeah, I think. I think is this is it this year where they've got is it three? It's four from. 
I can't remember. Yeah, three from the I don't remember which exactly which one it was, but yeah, I would imagine it's two bid league unless it's really bad. Because I mean, it'll it'll be everyone's gonna talk about Kansas State and Utah They're and the, Arizona and Arizona, but those Kansas State and Utah I think are the top two that are favored and they're flip flopped and in the different ones I've seen. Arizona's gonna be good again too because they've got the two guys that were freshmen last year. They were yeah, that's, their offense is gonna be nasty. Oh, yeah. Their good. defense is not gonna be very good. Yeah, they're they're gonna be a Big Twelve team from 2011. But I'll, I'll be curious to see how how those teams i'm not saying the pac-12 is booty cheeks but i'll, I'll be curious to see how those teams play in in, in the in the big because 12. the we, pac-12 this year the pac-12 last couple of years was like the big 12 when we were playing which yeah. is like we're going to win a game 52 to 45 the big 12 now is not that the big 12 now is a much more defensive forward league despite what people who don't watch the big 12 think it's a much more defensive forward league and so you're going to have teams like kansas well kansas state's not a great example but a team like iowa state uh I don't think of anybody else as very exceptionally defensive forward. Baylor, I would say Baylor probably is more well, defensive. They're not going to be. They That's were true. bad last year. That's true. Aranda's on borrowed time. Anyway, it's it is a much more de- strong defensive league. Like last year, Texas was one of the best defenses in the country. Oklahoma, decent defense when they had a couple that fell apart. But anyway, uh, with them coming to the conference, it is isn't going to be as wide open as Oregon and Washington and USC where the top of the conference is majority really good offenses. I would just be really curious because, you know, we saw BYU who was what we thought was going to be the most uh, big boy football ready because they had played in, in, in an independent league as opposed to, you know, Cincinnati and UCF and Houston who played in the AAC. Um, and they didn't, you know, they didn't just well. You know, BYU, I think, started off the season okay, but then mm-hmm. as soon as they got into conference play, they got beat up. So I'd be curious to see, obviously, the Pac-12 is – bigger boy football than AAC or independent. But I'm curious. I'll be curious to see how the 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 toll of the Big 12, which I think is a more physical league than Pac 12, mm. how, you know, the the Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Utah, how they're going to do this next year. Yeah, I feel like and just to kind of wrap this up, I feel like the floor for this team would be seven and five. Anything because you because the team is the conference is going to be so balanced where like the upper half, if you put the bell curve of you know the an average team, which it's going to be sixteen teams, so the the eighth, the difference between the eighth and ninth team, so the top eight and the bottom eight, the top eight are going to be so close together, as far as quality is concerned, that if you miss a kick here or you uh, drop a ball here or you uh, you know fumble something here or don't capitalize when the other team does make a mistake, there are going to be games that are close that have the potential to be lost if you don't dial them in and don't button them up. It is reasonable to expect that some of those bounce against Iowa State, but it feels like seven and five would be a realistic floor for this team. But a realistic ceiling is something like 10 and two, 11 and one, depending on how the season shakes out. That would have to be an everything goes right. And seven and five feels like an everything goes wrong. But it feels like that's if the over under is anything less than like eight, I would probably take the over. But like eight and a half would be hard to bet on for me. If it was, I, if Iowa State's eight and a half on the preseason, uh, that would be a hard over on. I would probably take the over, but that's, I think, where it probably would be set. Can I give you a very bold prediction? Please do. Iowa State's going to go nine and three and get their 10th win in the Alamo Bowl. Ooh. Does that make them not, not a playoff team? Correct. Not a playoff team. Oh. That, that's, that's my prediction. And if, if it happens better than that, sweet. Great. But that, that's what I think is going to happen. But it's still, to, to, to finally like put a last little bit, there has never been a better time to be a For fan real. of Iowa State Athletics. The football team's going to be a top 25 team. Football team's top 25. Men's basketball team's top five. Women's basketball, top 25, probably top 15. Wrestling, top three. And uh, Cytown is going to be done at some point in the next couple of years. And I think our women's tennis team's rolling. Uh, volleyball teams, volleyball probably, teams gonna be good probably too. Probably pretty good. I mean, I there's cross country teams. Cross, cross country is always good. Yeah, cross country is always good. So it's just it's a good time uh, to be a fan of Iowa State, or perhaps some say a fanatic of Iowa State. Hey, um, there you go. It's a great reminder. Get on the premium board. I was just about to say a that lot premium of info board. For spring ball. A lot of info for spring ball. A lot of info for a transfer portal for both men's and women's. So uh, pony up. It's worth it. Go buy your pizzas and your beer if you haven't already too. Pizza's really good too. I haven't had it. It's really good. The pizza, I'm not a sauce guy. No non-sauce guy. That's that's the best pizza sauce I've ever tasted. The, the pizza's really good. And I'm and I'm not just saying that. Like, I'm not being biased. I've said some pretty biased stuff in here before. That pizza's really good. I haven't had it. That's not I'm not saying I'm not against frozen what pizza. Is, man. I'm not against Williams, frozen pizza. Williams is, Williams is big on like the breakfast pizza. I haven't had that before. I've had um I think just pepperoni, which is really good. 
but they have all meat I, that I really like. I'd probably do the breakfast pizza. I'm a big breakfast pizza guy. Yeah, yeah. Big I, I'm, a, pizza I'm guy. a big, I'm a big pas- Pasquale's guy. I was. Ooh, un- Squally's. Until I had this. Mm. Yeah. Better so, than Pasquale's? Um, I, I haven't, I, I'm usually like a breakfast pizza Pasquale's guy, or or I'll go sausage mushroom Pasquale's. So I, I haven't had a sausage Pasquale's mushroom. breakfast pizza is A. plus. If it's anywhere near Elite. Pasquale's breakfast pizza, I'm in. Uh, I, just I haven't, haven't gotten it. I haven't tried I, it. Yet. I just, so when I when I do have it, I I will try it and I'll give you my feedback okay. on that. We frozen pizza is not a, a common occurrence, but on busy weeks when you have a lot of time to cook, sure. it's just nice to have something in the oven. You can have like two or three slices, and I feel like a total turd, uh, but also feel fe- fairly satiated, and it leaves you something for the next. I the was next an, day. I was in absolute turd mode uh, Thursday and Friday, the first Thursday and Friday of of the uh, big dance. Uh, got myself a couple a six pack of Ames Lager, a couple pizzas, just. Didn't move from the couch. For the next two or three days, all you did was just shit. But those two days of just enjoying it on the couch were glorious. Worth it. For Wor- sure. Worth. Took took uh, <sighs> took work off and took, just sat on the couch. <sighs> took work I, was, off. I was gripping and gripping and stopping. So gripping the sides of the oh, toilet and yeah. stopping my feet. Yep. <laughs> so uh let's wrap this up though. Thank you to all of our loyal listeners. Uh if you are still listening. Uh, I know we've kind of rambled on here for a little over an hour, hour and five, six minutes. Uh, But as always, remember, adopt, don't shop.